Hello and welcome to episode one of Econ to Action, our new podcast series where we bridge the gap between what we're seeing in the U.S. economy from inflation, the labor market, and the Federal Reserve to how financial institutions are taking manageable steps to remain well-footed and in tune with the needs of consumers in an unpredictable economic environment. My name is Josie Farmer. I'm an economic analyst here at Experian, and I will be your host. Today, we'll have with us our very first guest, Chris Szymanski. Chris is a senior client executive in the credit union space at Experian, representing some of our country's biggest credit unions. When we were launching this podcast, we knew we wanted our first guest to be well-versed in their craft, someone aware of the intricacies of the market that they work in, and someone who really understands how the economy plays a fundamental role in the health of their market. That's why we have Chris here today, and honestly, I want the spotlight to be on him. So welcome, Chris. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Very humbled to kick off what I think is going to be a very engaging and relevant podcast series, Josie. So appreciate being here with you. Absolutely. So, Chris, tell me a little bit about your background and the type of businesses that you primarily work with. Yeah, so I spent 10 years in corporate and consumer finance before joining Experian. I was a, a client of Experian for much of that time, and most recently, before joining, used a diverse range of Experian data to help me manage a consumer credit card portfolio for a top 25 issuer. Since joining Experian in 2019, I found myself very fortunate to work with some amazing partners who represent some of the largest credit unions in the country. These partners range in asset size all the way up to sizes comparable to larger regional banks. Their footprints are always are also broad, some spanning the entire U.S. with a range in membership demographics. Awesome. So you've been utilizing Experian data for a while now, and you've done so through some interesting economic times as well. But, you know, I'm sure everyone here listening is aware of the interesting dynamics that we have at play currently that we haven't seen in decades. You know, I mentioned earlier that it's an unpredictable economic environment. We've been through a period of record high inflation, very high interest rates, delinquencies on the rise. Which of these dynamics would you say is most relevant to your market? I think it's difficult to label a certain dynamic as most relevant. Uh, there are a few taking priority and driving very strategic conversations with, with our partners. They are very aware that change is inevitable, but successfully navigating this environment is certainly optional for them. Uh, one priority that is very consistent is the need to understand the data assets to enable what we call seeing around the corner. And what I mean by that is identification of key risk indicators for understanding the financial stability of your consumers, how those are changing, and what data assets we should be considering to unlock this insight. Uh, in most cases, it's, it's really supplementing current data and practices that the credit union employs with additional layers. The key here always is the practical application of that insight, though. So once we add more data assets, what do we do about it or, or what do we change? Just a few examples include how payment hierarchies have changed, how many people are disconnecting auto pay, how many consumers are moving to paying a minimum payment due? And are my consumers seeking credit financing through facilities not traditionally reflected within the off-the-shelf credit scores we consume? That's super interesting. So, you know, a lot of those changes in consumer behavior that you're mentioning can probably be traced back to some level of financial strain or pressure, which definitely comes with this period of high inflation that we've been experiencing. We had an economic webinar back in May where we asked the audience, it was roughly 700 attendees, that same question, and inflation did come in as the area of most concern for over half of the respondents. Moving forward here, we know deposits have been a big challenge recently, but there are still organizational growth expectations during these ambiguous macro environments. Could you speak to whether the financial institutions that you work with are still focusing on growth or whether they're focusing more on risk management during this time? Yeah, there is an overt increase in focus on risk management and portfolio management across the board, some of which I, I really just touched on, but a lot of it's materializing in ways such as looking at their consumers' refresh credit scores and data on a more frequent basis. Uh, the other shift of focus is pre-delinquency strategy. Our partners want to create insight throughout the consumer lifecycle, starting at account opening, 
because many are starting to feel in some cases it's, it's too late once consumers get into the top of the delinquency funnel, meaning they've already decided that they aren't paying you back. Uh, deposits specifically pose a real challenge and there are various dependencies going into managing the strategy for our partners. A few of these I'll mention include managing capital ratios, understanding deposits at risk of attrition with both high net worth and lower income band consumers, being able to lend at a pace that reflects consumer appetite for credit, staying competitive with products and rates, and lastly, being deliberate with targeting off-book deposit opportunity. Got it. And then piggybacking off of that, how are the financial institutions that you work with maintaining a strong and engaged membership base in order to retain deposits? So two conversations are really bubbling up here. One is around how can we help capture wallet share in these types of environments when peers are potentially pulling back? So in other words, how can I be selectively aggressive? It's really a sophisticated approach that leaves little room for error, but you find the most mature analytical organizations being able to take away the most product wallet balance and spend share in these environments. Two is around investment in experiences that are relevant to the preferences of your target demographics. So payment preferences, credit education, and budgeting tools specifically. The results from us helping provide solutions here are brand awareness, retention, digital engagement, and tangible improvements in your consumer financial well-being. And to emphasize this, I just read an industry study reflecting 43% of 25 to 34 year olds are interested in budgeting tools from their FIs. Our partners know this is important and it's great to be able to help them here. Got it, yeah, that, that demographic statistic really stands out to me. I read something similar recently as well. You know, thinking about it, it makes sense that providing budgeting and other financial tools would be beneficial in an economic environment like the one we're in, especially to those who haven't ever experienced something similar, which in this post-pandemic environment could be said for most everyone, but especially that younger generation. So shifting gears here a bit, you mentioned earlier the way payment hierarchies have changed as being a key data asset for financial institutions to utilize. Could you speak to how consumer payment hierarchy has changed since the pandemic? Is it uniform or different across certain segments of consumers? Yeah, what's interesting is while overall 90 days past due delinquency has increased or, or really normalized to pre-pandemic levels, aggregate consumer payment priority descending from mortgage, auto, bank card, and retail mostly hasn't changed. Um, we're really lucky to work with some very talented analytical resources who refresh this consistently. And it was really interesting to see because there were material changes in payment priorities to pre to post Great Recession in 2006 to 2008 and after. Uh, it's certainly not uniform as you get into different bundles of trade line comparisons regionally or even you know, segments of consumers who have different behavioral propensities. Again, this is just another really important piece of the puzzle for FIs looking to gain insight about potential performance of their consumers. Got it. Thank you. And I really appreciate that information surrounding the shift from pre to post Great Recession, you know, obviously this transition from the pre to post pandemic world won't look the same, but it's good to have that additional context. Now, I don't want to take any more of your time, but it has been an absolute pleasure hearing from you and getting to pick your brain today, Chris. Thank you for being brave enough to be our very first guest. And lastly, something I want to do for our audience at the end of these podcasts is to leave you with one economic statistic to think about over the course of the next month. We all know the labor market has been very strong and unemployment has been low, but in April, which is the latest state level unemployment data, a whopping 10 states across the country hit their all time unemployment lows, including Arizona, Ohio, and Wisconsin, just to mention a few. Thanks everyone for tuning into Econ to Action and please check back in next month for our next episode where we'll explore yet another market. Thanks again, bye.